I'm glad you all could make it on a hot summer day. I'm sure you will learn a lot from this talk. Today's talk is about evolutionary architecture. So when I was uh, reading up online and trying to figure out what's the difference between architecture and design, um, so obviously architecture is something that talks about the design of a system, the structure of its various components and how they communicate. And design is probably more on the algorithm than actual implementation. Uh, but a simpler definition is Architecture is something that's hard to change. So once you decide those pieces of the software that are hard to change are usually the architectural decisions. And design is a little more manageable. Um, so but then this title of the talks is evolutionary. So evolutionary by definition is change. And architecture is things which are hard to change. So on the face of it, it seems contradictory. So if you could really get to a stage where architecture is evolvable, then that's that's awesome. So uh, that was my primary like, excitement on listening about somebody who actually has done this. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the speaker today probably needs no introduction. Uh, but I'll just go ahead and do my best. So, for people who have not, uh, don't know about me for, so he's a director, software architect, and Neem Brangler at Powerworks. He's an international recognized expert on software development and delivery, especially in the intersection of agile engineering techniques and software architecture. Neem has authored magazine articles, seven books, and counting, um, dozens of video presentations, and spoken at hundreds of developer conferences worldwide. His topics of interest include software architecture, continuous delivery, functional programming, cutting-edge software innovations, and includes a business-focused book and video on improving tech presentations. Um, if you will learn more, you can check out his website at e4.com. So, without further ado, over to me. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, every time I hear someone read my bio, it makes me know I hope you guys read my bio. You know, it's a great time to talk about the ethics. So, uh, welcome, as you said, one of the things that we've struggled with for a long time is how do you actually effectively change architecture? Like you said, uh, the tongue in cheek definition for a long time for architecture was the stuff that's hard to get away But that's a real problem for us because everything in our world is constantly changing and the concept works. And so we need to get better at managing that change, and that's exactly what this topic is about, about building new architecture. So let's talk about building architectures that can change gracefully over time. So when you think about building software to solve some sort of problem, you have requirements of some kind. And I don't really care how you got these requirements, or the use cases, or scoring hard, you have some reason to build software uh, to solve a problem. But this is not the only thing you have to think about as an architect. You have to think about it, a lot of other characteristics of the architecture as well. Things like performance, and scalability, and auditability. These are all these extra characteristics that you have to take into account. And this is, in fact, the skill and craft of software architecture. Given some requirements, given these external characteristics, how can I balance and try to maximize all these things? This is why you hear the word trade-off so often used when talking about architecture, because you're trading off these various concerns with an architecture. The problem is there are lots of those things that you can support. There's a partial list for Wikipedia of things that you can support in software, and there are a lot of them. And this is only a partial list. In fact, you can pretty much take any English word and turn it into an architectural characteristic just by adding more ability to the event. I've seen a lot of projects that suffered from resume ability, where they're trying to add as many frameworks as possible into this project so we look really good on the resume for the next project. And that becomes the ability of software architecture. What we're trying to do is add another ability to this list, which is this idea of evolvability. But what does that mean to have an evolving architecture? Well, if you've chosen performance, for example, as a really important characteristic of your architecture, to say that architecture is evolvable means that as you change that system over time, you don't negatively affect performance. Because you've chosen that as one of your key characteristics of your architecture, to have an evolution of architecture means you can preserve those characteristics over time as you change your system. That's what it means to have an evolution of architecture. Well, let's 
talk for a moment about change. Because we normally think of change as just one kind of thing. But for us in the software world, it's really two kinds of things we talk about change. There's technology-driven change, and there's also business-driven change. The business-driven change is what we've really been focusing on for the last 20 years or so in agile software development. Uh, these are the things that come from changing requirements. We have one set of requirements, and then you change them because the business has changed, you change the direction. Or maybe you merge with another business, you have to merge all their functionality and your functionality. This is this idea of business driven change. And this has really been the subject of agile software development for the last two years or so. If you look at most books on agile software development, that's the kind of change they're talking about managing is managing this business change, the domain change that's always coming along as we make changes in our system. The kind of change, though, that we've been much less good at managing is this technology-driven change. This change that happens to us because of the world that we live in. So we uh, characterize the software development ecosystem as a dynamic equilibrium. So if you think about the software development ecosystem, this is the combination of all the tools and frameworks and practices and best approaches we have, everything we know about how to build software up until about five minutes ago. That is the software development ecosystem, and that's where we live and work on a daily basis. But it's extremely dynamic, meaning that it can shift and change at any time without notifying. And a great example of this is when Docker hit our ecosystem a few years ago. Once Docker hit our ecosystem, it fundamentally changed our ecosystem forever. Even if you're not using Docker yet, it changes the kinds of decisions you can now make about how to build your system in the future because that capability exists in your ecosystem. But these things happen suddenly without any warning, and this is a real problem for some traditional architecture roles because everything changes all the time in our ecosystem. But this is a real problem because some architects, like enterprise architects, are tasked with building long-term strategic plans for software building a five-year plan for what we're going to do with software, but that's a fool's error because long-term planning is impossible when everything changes in unexpected ways all the time. I've been meeting with a lot of enterprise architects across the world, and I keep asking them the same question, and none of them has a good answer for it. So maybe somebody in this room has a good answer to this question. So I'll pose it to you guys. Can you tell me with certainty exactly what JavaScript web framework you could be using two years from now. And you can't because it probably hasn't been written yet. How can you possibly do long-term strategic planning in a world like that? And of course, the answer is you cannot. It's a fool's error to try to do that. But why are we trying to do long-term strategic planning? Well, we have to because change is really expensive and difficult, and so we're trying to avoid that change in the head by polishing our crystal ball and getting it better and better so we can predict the future. But we can't predict the future. And so if predictability is shot, what we need is the ability to adapt to changes as they come along. Because if change is not extensively difficult and we can incorporate that change as it comes along, then we don't have to do long-term strategic planning and we can be a lot more adaptable uh, for the world that we live in. But in the course of writing this book, we also discovered a bunch of secondary effects that we weren't expecting, and here's one of them. And this is a common problem in architecture. So let's say that, as an architect, you have analyzed this problem carefully, and you come up with a beautiful, elegant solution to the problem you're trying to solve that balances all these things beautifully. And then you hand it to developers in the messy real world to implement the solution. How can you make sure they're not going to take this beautiful, elegant design and completely trash it as they're implementing it by making small and large compromises all over the place? In other words, once you've chosen something like performance, how can you make sure that doesn't degrade over time as you start implementing it and you start adding more features to the system? Um, so a lot of the examples in our book are cast against this fake company that we created called Penultimate Widgets that makes the last widget manufacturer. Uh, but this is all based on experience we have with our clients. And this is one of those based on experience I had with one of our clients where uh, 
uh, they are in the process of replatforming their system. And when I showed up, they had built a spreadsheet of all the aspirational goals for the next system. And there's things like four nines and resilience and elasticity and all these things that they really wanted. And I said, you know, it's really great that you identify all these things that you want in the architecture. But when I come back in six months, how many of these things are still going to be true? And maybe more to the point, how easily can you tell me how many of these things are still true? This is a traditional problem in software. If we define these things, sometimes in vague terms, and then there's no easy way to verify them. So what do you do? Do you do code review, architecture review boards, all these things continuously fall through the pack, so there's no way you have time to constantly check all those things. So this is another way of asking this question. Once I've built an architecture, how can you prevent it from gradually degrading over time? But this is really a question that has traditionally been handled by architectural governance. And it turns out that the evolution of architecture stuff gives you some insight into governance as well. So let's talk about the definition. Anytime you try to create a new industry term like this, you need to have a definition for it. And so here's our definition of an evolution of architecture. Uh, it supports a guided incremental change across multiple dimensions. We'll talk about this definition in three parts. The first part of it is the guiding part of this definition. <laughs> now, one of my co authors is Rebecca Parsons. He's a PCO cohort. She's also a PhD in computer science, and she has a history of doing work in the evolutionary computing space. Um, and the evolutionary and our evolutionary uh, architecture is more related to evolutionary computing and necessarily it's biology, of course, things are all closely related. Um, so let's talk for a second about uh, evolutionary computing and genetic algorithms. So there are all these techniques in the evolutionary computing world and genetic algorithms. We can create an algorithm and it will mutate itself through each generation and produce a new result. And so the algorithm is really genetic algorithm. If I'm going to design this algorithm, it's going to get to mutate itself and it's going to gradually get towards better solutions with that problem. Let's talk for a second about so there's a concept in the evolutionary computing world that I have a fitness function. The fitness function, every time your algorithm produces a new solution, the fitness function is how you evaluate it to see am I closer or further away from what my ultimate end goal solution is. It's an objective function used to summarize how close the design solution is to what our goal is. So let's say, for example, that you were designing a genetic algorithm to design an airplane one. Every time you produce the design of an airplane wing, you would evaluate this in terms of aerodynamic lift and material weight and manufacturing cost. That would be the fitness function for this wing, and you're trying to get a better version each time it produces the design for it. We're borrowing this idea of fitness functions from evolutionary computing and creating this uh, concept of an architectural fitness function. So, this is any mechanism that gives you an objective integrity assessment for one or more architectural characteristics. Um, and I'll come back to this definition in a second, but the two really important things about this definition is that the techniques and tools we're going to use here are not new at all. The terminology is new, but a lot of the tools we're going to use have been around some a couple of decades. And I'll show you a bunch of examples of these in a second. The other really important thing about this definition is that this is an objective outcome. It doesn't have to be binary pass or fail, but it doesn't have to be objective, meaning that two experienced architects can agree that this is the value of the project. This is the answer to the question. Instead of codifying these things in a spreadsheet somewhere with no verification, instead write them as fitness function. And now we have both the definition of the characteristic and a way to check to make sure that that's still true at exactly the same time. I'll show you a bunch of examples of these guys. In the second, I want to finish my definition first. The next part of my definition is about incremental change, and there are two aspects of this that are important in evolutionary architecture. One is on the operational DevOps side, about how you put these in live, and the other is on the developer side of how you make sure that the functions get applied on a regular basis. I'll talk about the operational side first, and I'll come back to the developer side in just a bit. So here's an example of incremental change at the operational level. And again, this is cast as an example for our state company. 
So let's say that penultimate widgets have a catalog page that has a catalog of, of all the widgets on it. And one of the things you can do on the catalog page is install ratings for how much you like particular widgets, and then you can install rate shipping methods or customer service representatives. And so within their architecture, they have an install rating service running that a bunch of other services will have. And one day, they bring out a better install rating service that allows half star ratings. And they put it live in production. They don't force anyone to start using it, but now this is a new capability that exists within their ecosystem. And gradually over time, these other services that want star ratings are going to start migrating to the better star rating service because you get better get half star ratings and better half star ratings. Until eventually, no one is pointing to the old star rating service anymore. One of the magic tricks that Netflix taught us about architectures like this is that you monitor not only the services, but also the routes between the services. And any service that hasn't been routed to in a set amount of time automatically gets disintegrated out of the, uh, out of the production, out of production, out of the ecosystem. This is an incremental change in the operational level. The ability to put something live alongside the existing functionality, gradually migrate to it, and then clean up the old stuff that you don't need anymore. At the very end of my talk, I'll give you a great case study uh, that shows exactly how this is done on a website that does 60 to 40 days. And we managed to do exactly this kind of uh, incremental change. So that's the incremental change part. The last part of my definition is about multiple dimensions. And this is really just the realization that you can't really talk about evolving a software system and only talk about evolving the architecture. So certainly we have to think about architectural concerns like performance and scalability, but you'll also notice a couple of things on here that are traditionally not considered part of architecture, like security, I'll talk more about that in a second, and also data and relational databases. So we have a chapter in our book about evolutionary database design, but the more important book about that is actually on the wall back there that came out exactly 10 years ago by Promote Satellite and Scott Adler called Refactoring Databases. And if you look at the subtitle of that book, the subtitle is Evolutionary Database Design. So it is the perfect companion to our evolutionary architectures book because you will quickly realize you're trying to evolve a software system. You can't evolve just the architecture to leave the scheme that is fossilized in the terrible shape there is. You need to evolve your database schemas as well. And so this idea of multiple dimensions is the realization that lots of moving parts of the system will have to evolve. You can't just evolve the architecture without taking those other things into account as well. So that's our definition. An evolutionary architecture supports guiding incremental change across multiple dimensions. So that gives me enough now to give you the agenda for the rest of my talk this evening. The first part of which is a definition of evolutionary architecture, which you've now seen. And now I want to talk a little bit more about incremental change primarily about guided change via fitness functions, and a little bit about the governance uh, aspect of the value of fitness functions. So let's look at some more examples of fitness functions, because this is a very abstract thing right now. Let's make it more concrete by showing you some examples of this. And here's our definition again. Uh, again, it's really important to realize here that this is not, the only thing that's new about this is terminology. That this is actually going to wrap a bunch of existing mechanisms, so metrics, monitors, other things that can tell you interesting things about your architecture. These all fall into this category of fitness functions. We defined a whole uh, series of categories of fitness functions within our book. And so let me give you some examples. So amongst our categories, an atomic fitness function is one that concerns itself with only one architectural characteristic at a time. So performance and only performance, that would be a fitness function for that. A holistic fitness function cares about a combination of more than one architectural element. So very often these things interact with one another, you need to see the interaction, make sure it can work. A triggered fitness function is one that is triggered by some event, like a, a, a developer running a unit test, or continuous integration kicking off a build, so it's triggered by some, some event. So it's continuous means it just runs all the time within the so let's look at some examples of these guys. So I'll start with examples of atomic triggered fitness functions. So let's say 
And the architect of a, a modular model, a component-based system. When you have components like that, one of the things that you want to try to avoid are cyclic dependencies between your components. This is where you have one component which talks to another component, which talks to another one, which talks back to the original one. This is undesirable as an architect because now I can't reuse one of those components. I have to take the whole bunch of them with me. And so in general, you want to keep this down with your physics. But this is a really hard thing to battle because IDEs are so simple. So you're developing, you're coding along in Eclipse or Visual Studio, and you reference some class that you've never referenced before. What does your IDE do for you? Pops up a dialog, says you want to auto import that for you, and you swap that dialog away so fast you don't even see it anymore. Because it's just such a reflex. Yeah, I auto import that. If I came over and asked you, did you start import something? It's a, no, 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 I didn't auto import anything for at least a couple of hours. I swear, I will never do that. So what's happening is that auto import slap is creating these cycles without realizing it. Because you're not paying attention to that, because you're slapping that thing away. As the architect, once you chase these things out of the code base, you put a fitness function in place to make sure none of them come back. So this is using a metrics tool that has literally been around for more than two decades. Data 10 is the Java world. And what it can do is analyze your code base until you've got any cycles in your code base or not. So as the architect, once you get the cycles out of your code base, there are tools to help you do that too. The Structure 101 in Java, the independent in the .NET world, this will prevent them from coming back. Because now, if the developer accidentally creates a cycle, then this fails the test before they can check that code in. You can also do some things like directionality of imports. So let's say that you have a system with persistence web and utility. And it's okay for persistence import util. It's okay for web to import util, but you never want util to import web. You can define that rule programmatically here and have JDPen make sure that those developers are cheating on the way that you want your imports to work within your package structure of your application. So here, this is a couple of examples of very low-level metrics-based fitness functions. Let's look at a higher-level atomic fitness function. And this is a common problem in the microservices world. <laughs> Where you have a service provider of some kind, that is a service and some kind of autonomous team, but they're collaborating with three other services and they have integration points. Now you want these services to essentially be independent from one another, but they still have to integrate, and you want to know that if an integration point breaks. So this is the idea of consumer-driven contracts, which is popular in the microservices world. The idea is each of the consumers will create a set of tests and hand it to the provider, and the provider promises, I will keep those tests green always. So that test forms a contract for what that consumer needs from this provider. Now if the provider changes and does a breaking thing, then he changes in a way that nobody cared about, so nobody's worried about it. If it does break one of these tests, this becomes a placeholder for conversation that the team needs to get together again and reestablish this contract. And this is also true of a lot of fitness functions. We're not trying to build this ultra sophisticated thing that analyzes exactly what broke between those two things. A lot of what a lot of fitness functions are is just establishment of status quo. So they're going to say status quo, status quo, status quo, status quo. Something broke. Go fetch a human to come fix it. So a lot of things just happen over and over again. You don't care. It's only the anomalies that you care about. And this is exactly one of those cases. As long as none of these things break, these things don't have to worry each other. It's only when things break you need to start paying attention to them. And that's exactly what this does. And again, this is a, a common fitness function because all I care about here are integration points in architecture. So that's the single thing that I'm checking as I run this particular thing. So those are examples of triggered atomic fitness functions. Let's look at as an example of triggered holistic fitness functions. Now remember, holistic ones concern themselves with more than one dimension in architecture, because very often architectural dimensions play off of one another. So let's say that you're building a system that needs high scale, and one of the ways that you achieve the scale that you need is by using aggressive caching. And you have a, an atomic fitness function around scale that verifies that by using caching, you can achieve the level of scale that you want. You have another fitness function that looks at security aspects 
of your system. And one of the things it's looking at is stego data. A lot of medical systems cannot leave data on the screen too long. That's considered a bad thing. And so it runs within the comic fitness function and it works okay. But then when you turn on caching to achieve stale and then run the security fitness function, it fails. So now you have stale data on the screen. This is an example of these two characteristics interacting with one another. That's a holistic fitness function checking one or more characteristics and how they can interact with one another. The continuous ones run all the time. And these are more likely in the realm of operations of DevOps. And so let's look at some examples of atomic continuous fitness functions. These are mostly in the realm of things like monitoring and forensic logging tools. So for example, um, a common practice in microservices is that because you have a complex ecosystem running in production, I'd really like to know how long my transactions are taking in my production ecosystem. If they're taking too long, I want to raise a red flag to say, hey, something's going on because it's taking too long for these things to happen. A common way to do that in microservices is to generate synthetic transactions. This is a transaction that's generated in the system that goes through more, all the normal hops and choreography that a regular transaction does. Just when it gets to the very end, you throw it away and rather than commit it. But this allows you to time and do other sorts of interesting things to find out what's going on with it. Uh, and if you set up a monitor for that timing that will trigger if it takes too long, then that becomes a fitness function because we have an objective measure to say that if it takes longer than this, then notify me. And so this is a common practice in microservices and you can say transactions, test production systems. Another common practice in that world is use things like correlation IDs so you can trace exactly what route services are taking because you may want to know that. Uh, and they set up some sort of thresholds around those as well. So those are examples of things that run continuously uh, and are care about a single characteristic of your architecture. As you probably guess, the most powerful but most complex of these are continuous holistic fitness functions. And the best example we have of one of these that already lives out of the world is Netflix's Chaos Monkey and the entire Simeon army. So I'm sure you're familiar with Chaos Monkey, but in case you're not, when Netflix decided to start hosting all of their services on AWS, they started worrying because now they don't own their operations center, and what happens if AWS starts acting weird? They want to be able to react to that. And so they built the original Chaos Monkey. What the Chaos Monkey did was to sit on an AWS instance and start making it misbehave. It would drive the latency up, it would make it disappear halfway through the request, because we want to see how the architecture would react to these unusual circumstances that happen. So that was so successful, they created a whole Simeon army of open source ones, of all these different monkeys. And uh, including one of them, this is called the Chaos Gorilla. I live on the east coast of the US, and you probably remember about a year ago, Amazon East went down. And you probably read the forensics on that. Lack of automation, by the way, allowing some developer to type 100 where they can only should be able to type 10. And that's kind of beside the point. So I live in the East Coast of the US, and I have one of those green doorbells that when people walk up to the door, you get a little video of them. It turns out when Amazon East is down, all the magic drains out of the doorbell, and it's just a regular doorbell. You get no videos if Amazon East is down, because it's obviously using Amazon to do that. But so while Amazon East was down, Netflix stayed up. And they stayed up to call it the Chaos Gorilla, which simulates an entire AWS data center going down. And when it happened, they survived it. One of the other Simeon uh, armies is a monkey called the Doctor Monkey. And all the Doctor Monkey does is go visit each service in production and identify that all their RESTful endpoints are configured correctly. And if the service doesn't have correctly configured RESTful endpoints, it gets kicked out of production. Now the question for you guys. How many of you are on a project that has at least some RESTful endpoints on it somewhere in your project? Don't be shy, no bunch of you do. So people who raise their hand half-heartedly, raise your hand. How many of you are willing to guarantee me right now that every single one of your RESTful endpoints is configured exactly correctly? You can't do that, can you? I bet you'd like to be able to do that, wouldn't you? If you were a Netflix engineer, you could. 
because they have a real time running check in production to make sure that they never have misconfigured respiratory points. And so Netflix engineers never lose sleep over this because they have a fitness function in place guaranteeing that that characteristic of their architecture is always correct. That's a great example of the power of this idea of fitness function because now they don't constantly have to check when people make changes to code to make sure that they haven't worked in their endpoint, but they have a real-time check running in production to make sure that all those things are correct the way they should be. So that's an example of continuous holistic fitness function. And so when you decide, when you define these things, these are going to be things that you commonly see in architecture. Here's a spider graph that Rebecca created on a project that she worked on that was using these ideas. Uh, where they graded themselves one, didn't mean we're doing really well on this dimension, and five means we need a lot more work on it. And you'll notice the common kinds of things that you see in architecture, auditability, configurability, security. If you roll the way around over here, you'll see legal requirements. Now we clearly know of automated things in this world, and as much effort as we put into it, we have not been able to automate away lawyers yet. We're working on it, but it doesn't look promising. So some of these stages will be manual stages. But you still want to treat them as fitness functions. Because one of the benefits of this is taking a bunch of things that you thought were different categories of things and realizing that they're all part of the same category of things. For example, we have this concept of a system-wide fitness function, which is the aggregation of all these guys, which helps you with things like prioritization. Because right now, in most of the companies you're in, Security is its own separate silo. And they have a default answer for every question, which is no. And you can't argue against that no, because the security guy said no. I thought, all right, I guess we'll have to figure out something else to do now, because you can't argue that hard no, because there's no balancing that no with other architectural characteristics. But if you start treating security as just another fitness function, now you can start having conversations like, well, it's going to cost us this much to implement security and this much to implement high performance. Which of these things is more important? Because right now, security is the most important thing on Earth, but you can't argue with it. Now this allows you to start balancing these things and thinking about resource allocation and effort and importance and other things because now you're treating them all as equal members, not bizarre one-off things. So let me go back to the incremental business for a second. I talked about the operational side. Let's talk about the developer side. So once you define these fitness functions, you need to make sure that they get applied on a regular basis. And of course, the best mechanism for handling that comes from the continuous delivery world as we decide to the deployment pipeline. This could be continuous integration or it could be the deployment pipeline, but this is why automatically applies these things for you. So a deployment pipeline is sort of like continuous integration on steroids, multiple stages. We can put more and more sophisticated testing and verification in it. This becomes the perfect place for us to be able to put in our fitness function. Put a stage in your deployment pipeline to the simple atomic fitness functions early, maybe more complicated holistic ones in environments after you spun up machines and other stuff. But this is the, the place to make sure that you apply these fitness functions on a regular basis. Because it's one thing to create a performance fitness function, but if you create that, and don't run it for a month, and then you run it and your performance is terrible, you got a thousand check-ins, now you have a detected mission. But if you're running these every single time you check in your code, things never fall through the cracks because you find deficiencies as soon as they occur. So let's talk for a second about um, implementing this stuff, and I'll come back. Uh, let's talk about implementing fitness functions as governance, and this idea of automating uh, governance. A few more examples of the fitness function to do this. Questions? So I can't hear you. So I still can't hear you. You're going to speak up. You go a long way away. Yeah, I give it my microphone. I can't hear it all from back to me. Yeah. How complicated 
Well, so my definition of an evolution architecture is that you preserve those characteristics over time. So by definition, if you create a fitness function, you're building an evolution architecture. I think what you're asking, though, is how difficult it is to like these things. And is that, I mean, is that what you're asking? Because by our definition, having fitness functions in place enables an evolution architecture. So, on um. this. So far, what we understood is that the fitness function is set up in place. How complicated the rules are? How complicated the rules? Oh, how complete are the rules? Well, it depends on the, the characteristic you're looking for. So, if I have a fitness function around cyclomatic complexity, it can be absolutely comprehensively complete. But I will not allow any code other or greater than the cyclomatic complexity of the threshold in my code base, because that's a definable thing. If it's something about performance, then it's probably a sliding scale about what is acceptable performance. And this actually gets back to exactly what I was about to bring up here. So, this is actually a really nice segue. One of the things we're trying to get architects to do is get away from vague, meaningless terms like this. You'll hear architects say, we want a maintainable code base. And they drop the whiteboard marker and walk out of the room. All the developers look at each other and go, well, what does that mean? Scalable, resilient, maintainable. None of those words mean anything. We're trying to get this to an engineering discipline. So we want one level deeper than this. What does it mean to be maintainable? It means we have a cyclomatic complexity less than 50. It means we have good after and effort coupling. It means we have these coding standards in place. So those are measurable, objective things that we can now start testing. So that's what I'm trying to do is get all these vague things down to measurable, objective things. Remember, my definition included the word objective. I'm trying to get objective outcomes because the secret to engineering is repeatability. But before you can repeat stuff, you have to be able to measure it. Before you can measure stuff, you have to have objective outcomes that you're measuring towards. This is how we're going to turn software development into an engineering discipline is by constantly pursuing objective outcomes. And so we're getting rid of things like maintainable and thinking much more deeply about the kind of things we can test objectively. So let me give you some examples of those things. Here's an example about layering. So a really common thing that you want in microservices in terms of the way you package up your code. So in, in domain-driven design and microservices, what you want to do is create a single package that has, controls everything for a particular domain. So the controller, the server, the data access will be a single package or partition here, another one will be another one. And you can design this architecture, but when you hand it to developers to implement it, how can you make sure they're not going to start cheating and calling up all these boundaries? You build a fitness function. There's a tool called Code Assert that lets you build a fitness function for that um, that basically checks to make sure that you don't cheat on your packaging, and if you do, it fails the test. Now, you can build exemptions into this if you have a utility package or something that you do want them to call a lot that one out. Oh, here's the test that I was talking about. This basically says this can use everything within this package to call everything else, but can't call anything outside this package. And here's the test that you run to verify that. And if you do want to build exemptions, you can build exemptions into this code by saying it's okay to call the utility package and not these others. So now I'm actually testing the way that my code is partitioned uh, within my code base. Here's another example of that. Using this really nice tool called ArcUnit, which lets you test a bunch of architectural characteristics. And it has a bunch of predefined things in it that you might want to test that are uh, predefined constants. So for example, a common smelly thing in a Java code base is throwing a generic exception. There's a one-liner here that says no classes should throw generic exceptions. You put that test in place, now any developer that throws a generic exception, it'll fail this test. Now you can chase all the generic exceptions out of your code base and start using actual real exceptions instead. So there are a bunch of standard things like this, like standard strings, etc. Uh, you've gotten into a logging. You can also define things like coding standard rules. So one of the common smelly things that people do is create interfaces with the name interface on the name of the interface. This is a dumb idea. This is a coding rule that prevents that from happening. Interfaces should not have names in with the word interface. 
Uh, no classes that are interfaces should have names matching an interface. So when you define these rules, it uses this handcraft style of matching, and you can define a really, really nice and readable rule for this. So another thing that you might want to do from an architectural standpoint is you're building a layered architecture. And in a layered architecture, you want the presentation layer to be all together, the business layer to be together, and the data layer to be together. As the architect, you design this, but then you give it to developers to implement, and one of the things they say is, well, you know, for reporting, it takes too long to go through all these layers, so I'm going to go directly from the presentation layer right to the data access layer. But you don't want that as the architect because you put those layers in place for a reason. Here's a test that verifies that no developers do that. And this is using that handcraft style matching. This says that no classes that reside in a package server should access classes that reside in a package controller. Now I can codify that rule as the architect, and now developers can't cheat on that and start breaking the design that I put forth in my architecture. This is really an example of doing architectural governance via a fitness function. Another common thing that might happen on code bases is that you have this utility class that you have to call, but it has a security problem or some other issue with it that you always need to call it via wrapper class. And it would be really bad if a developer instantiated that thing directly. You always want to make sure it's called through the wrapper. And that's exactly what this custom rule does in Arcanus. It allows you to find that this thing should be called uh, with a constructor. The target is a constructor. The target owner is assignable to that third party class. The original owner is not assignable to that third party class or subtype. And you cannot instantiate this thing directly. You always have to instantiate through the workaround factor. Now, as the architect, I may not have to worry about anybody instantiating these things directly because I'm requiring them to instantiate through the wrapper, and now I have a rule in place to make sure that they always do that. So, this is really a question of architectural governance. You know, put rules in place to make sure that bad things don't happen in your code base, and of course, the toilet pipelines are great places to do that. So, let me give you a few examples. Now, most fitness functions are going to be very local to project because the architectural characteristics are very local to that particular implementation of a project. But you may have a few global sort of enterprise architect level fitness functions. So let's say, for example, you decide that you want to get a handle on code quality across your organization. And you, so let's assume for a moment that all of your projects are running into one of the pipeline or continuous integration. And you have a stage in there that the enterprise architects can put code into if they want. Now, we're not trying to create this like really elaborate set of rules that people are checking in, but maybe you want to herd people for correct behavior. So here's an example. So let's say that you decided you want to clean up some of the bad code that's floating around in your uh, ecosystem. Uh, and so you put a fitness function globally in your organization in place for cyclomatic complexity assistance. And I chose that number, so cyclomatic complexity is an ancient metric that tests how complicated a function or method is. And I chose 50 as the threshold because there used to be a metrics tool in the Java world called craft for j that tried to determine how crappy your code was. And it used a combination of code coverage and cyclomatic complexity to determine that. And if your cyclomatic complexity ever got to 50, no amount of code coverage would make your code not crappy. And so 50 is a good threshold. You should never have a functional method in your code base more than 50 cyclomatic complexity. That is just giant smelling. So let's say you put a fitness function in place globally, and now you run it in 30 projects fail. So we've got these giant, enormous functions. Instead of making out a hard error, you can make that a warning and start coding in for the best behavior. So here's a common experience that many of you have. As an architect, you go to the project manager and say, it's through nobody's fault, we have accumulated technical debt in our code base, and we need some time to handle and fix that technical debt. And the project manager immediately comes back to you with two questions. One of which is, didn't you ask me for this six months ago? And I gave it to you, now you're asking me for it again. How do I know you're not going to ask me again in six months for the same thing? Here's a legit question. The other question is, if I give you this time to clean up technical debt, 
how do I know that's what you're going to do and not just play around and claim more of your shiny stuff or something like that? But I don't know what you're doing in your time. So let's say that you put that fitness function in place globally and it fails 30 projects. And you convert it to a warning and you tell those projects, okay, in three months, I'm going to turn that back into an error. You have this much time to get your act together. Now at the end of that three months, you can go back to the project manager and say, okay, our code is objectively this much better now because we used to have 30 projects with this problem, now we have two. So we, we now better and because we put a fitness function in place, we'll never have to slay this dragon again. Because our, our psychometric complexity will never get high and out of control again because we put a lid on it now because we have a fitness function running to make sure that doesn't happen. But the next time I need to attack technical debt, it'll be a different kind of technical debt. And we can put a lid on that, and over time, we can absolutely make objective progress in cleaning this stuff up and be able to demonstrate that progress as well. So here's another example. And this one's not so abstract. So let's say that, or I'll ask a question to you guys, what do you do if one of the web frameworks you're using suffers from a zero-day security exploit? And this is not an abstract question. This happened to a major financial institution in the U.S., Equifax, who was using an effective version of Struts, and a zero-day export came out. So what did they do? They did what any large enterprise would do. The security guys got all excited, and they ran around and trying to find every project that was using the effective version of Struts. They found a bunch of them. They missed a bunch of them, too. The thing is fell through the cracks. This is one of the really important lessons that DevOps taught us. Because what was the problem in operations before DevOps? We had a bunch of people who manual ad hoc stuff over and over again. Things were constantly falling through the cracks. And the way we fixed that was by automating all those things so that now things don't fall through cracks. What does governance look like in your organization right now? A bunch of very expensive people, architects, running around doing manual ad hoc stuff like code reviews, architecture review boards, and things are constantly falling through the cracks. Same for your security guys. But what if you're living in a world where all of your projects had a deployment pipeline, and maybe the security team had a stage of your deployment pipeline, and maybe it does something simple on every project, like make sure you're not checking passwords and version control rules and things like that. The day that zero-day export comes out, the security team can put a test in every deployment pipeline that says if you're using this effective version of struct, fail this build. Now, no code that's affected by the export goes live, and now they can look at all the ones that fail that test and find out exactly what project is using that effective version and go fix that before they're allowed to go live again. One of the important lessons we learned from automation is that we don't automate things Things constantly fall through the cracks that you miss, and when you start automating stuff, you get a lot better consistency uh, and the ability to be able to uh, capture things like uh, security exports. So that's again this idea of governance as a uh, business function of the governance mechanism. <coughs> so, what does it take to put this into practice? Well, the first thing you have to do, of course, is identify which dimensions you're going to create fitness functions for. One of the things that we talk about, and this is really a prioritization exercise, you could literally spend the rest of the year coming up with all the different ways you can support every possible ability on Earth in your software architecture. And that's not a good use of your time. So one of the things you need to do is figure out what are the really key characteristics of this architecture that I want to preserve over time. What are the really primary characteristics that define this architecture, identify those dimensions, they're going to be really important, then you're going to build fitness functions around those important dimensions. So we talk about primary and secondary characteristics in architecture. The primary ones are the ones you want really robust fitness functions around. That's the thing that's going to protect those characteristics over time. Uh, we refer to these things as, as uh, guardrails um, to keep things within the lane, although the idea of staying within a lane is kind of a, a strange concept here because nobody stays within the lane here. But you do have guardrails on either side of the road that won't let you swerve off the road, so that's exactly what these guys are. Uh, this is what preserves those things over time. 
And of course, we use deployment pipelines to automate, particularly the triggered fitness functions to make sure they get applied on a regular basis. Now, when you create a new project, it's when you define what the primary and secondary architectural characteristics are going to be for that project. That's when you choose what architectural pattern you're going to use to implement this architecture. And so that's when the lion's share of these fitness functions are going to be defined is at a project inception as you're defining the key characteristics of the architecture. But this is also an ongoing living part of your code base because you will notice things that start exhibiting uh, undesirable behavior as you're building it and you'll put fitness functions in place to do that. These are living parts of your code base just as much as a test suite is a living part of your code base. You'll change these over time as you need to, uh, and as your system grows, you'll change these things over time. But they also give you really good uh, baseline for things. So let's say, for example, that we decided we want to play, replace Angular with React. But we already have a performance fitness function in place. We leave that fitness function in place and change the implementation. That allows us to see how close we can get to our previous baseline and what efficiency we have as we're making this implementation change. And so even making structural changes and implementation changes, the fitness function can stay in place to make sure that you're still preserving uh, those important characteristics in your architecture. The last thing I want to leave you with is an example of incremental change at the operational level. And this is from the GitHub engineering blog, an entry that they call Move Fast and Fix Things. So GitHub is a very agile, a very aggressive agile engineering organization. They do continuous deployment. They average 60 deploys a day. So every time they make a change to their code base, it goes to a deployment pipeline gauntlet, and it goes live because it passes all those steps. And this blog entry is about a problem they encountered. So it turns out since day one at GitHub, the way they have merged two Git projects is to uh, shell out to a shell script, have command line get merge those two projects, and then suck it back into GitHub. And that works flawlessly because command line get knows exactly how to merge two projects. The problem is, this doesn't scale particularly well. And one of the problems they have is they operate at extreme scale. He said one of the side effects of that is every edge case appears almost instantly because they're operating at such scale. And so they finally bit the bullet and decided, okay, we're going to have to rewrite Merge with our own in-memory version of Merge to get better performance. So they did. And they did their due diligence testing on it. But now here comes the scary part. Now I want to replace Merge in production. But here's a problem. You can't break Merge. Merge has been flawlessly perfect since day one. And the last thing you want to do is start introducing regression in something that has never had bugs in it before. But this is a really common problem in architecture. How can you make major structural changes without introducing instabilities and side effects and other bad things? This is one of the reasons that architecture is so scary. So if I can't change this one thing because it may have all these unanticipated side effects. What these guys did, an open source to allow you to do the same thing, is create this tool called scientists. And if you go to where scientists is defined, they've already ported this or half a dozen other languages uh, from the original Ruby that they wrote it in. And here's what scientists does. Scientist allows you to conduct experiments. So scientists has two blocks. It has a use block and a try block. The use block is what it used to always do, and the try block is the experiment we're trying out and we're experimenting with. And so when scientists hit one of these experiment blocks, the first thing it does is decide whether or not to run the try block. For the merge experience, they have this uh, uh, experiment that has for 1% of merge requests that are running try. They always run use, and that's what they always return to the user. So the worst case scenario if you follow this experiment is you get exactly the same answer back you've gotten before. But they're also running try in the background, randomizing the order in which they're going measures duration and uh, uh, performance, compares the results of try to use, swallows and records any exceptions, and then publishes all the stuff in the dashboard. So here's when the code first went live. At 2.20 a.m., they're doing uh, a little over 2,000 merges within that minute at 2.20 a.m. If you look along the bottom here, you can see some tiny red tick marks. 
So uh, you're right. So some of these are more complicated than that. So yeah, we can so he's saying that things like psychometric complexity are super easy to test, or you have metric tools for those. What about things like performance and security? But, so here's a good question. As the architect, what do you mean by performance? I want objective numbers. So performance, do you mean a certain number of availability, a certain uh, a certain response time? Give me hard numbers, and I can check those objectively. If you just say performance, two architects can argue for hours over what performance means. But if I say performance means that every request uh, takes less than 100 milliseconds, that's something I can test. And the other thing you have to think about is people get caught up in these architectural characteristics like performance because they think, well, you know, performance also applies to availability and resiliency. But you can test those things independently a lot of times. So performance in particular, if you only care about performance and you define that in terms of response time for request and response, 
that you can do an atomic performance test and just test that for a single request and have a good baseline for that and then do a holistic test to see how performance reacts under high scale. So this is one of the things we talk about, kind of dynamic values for fitness functions. Remember, it doesn't have to be binary, it just has to be objective. And so it could be that we say as scale goes up, performance can go down, but within a threshold it's okay, but if it falls off too much, then we need to start looking at it and doing something else. Some of these are going to be very difficult to implement. And some of them we don't have these capabilities to implement yet. But we probably will. Because as people start thinking about this a lot more, we're going to see a lot more interesting stuff come out of this. In fact, there's a giant amount of interest right now in chaos engineering. A few of the Netflix engineers just released a book from O'Reilly about chaos engineering. And those are almost all uh, uh, continuous holistic fitness functions for us. Those would be very hard things to write, but somebody's already written a bunch of those, like semi an army and that kind of stuff for you. So even the really difficult things we're seeing, tools start showing up and make it easier to test those things. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that those kind of things are going to become easier and easier to test because we are thinking about the other stuff. One question. When you talk about fitness functions, we are mostly talking about quantitative things like the performance and the There are qualitative things like the pervasiveness of the class uh, or single responsibility things that we try to attack. Mm -hmm. How do you write fitness functions? Uh, well, it depends on which one you're looking at. So, single responsibility principle is really cohesion. And there are lots of metric tools that check for the cohesion things. Mm -hmm. So single responsibility principle may say that only this class does this particular thing, and you can check this to make sure that there are no other classes that are responsible for that particular thing. But it really gets down to uh, figuring out the objective thing to check and then figuring out a way to check that thing. So I can say some of these things are going to be hard to, to test because it's uh, they're less metrics or less uh, the readily available tools to do that. Uh, and so some of them will be manual. Uh, we can't automate all these things. Some of them will have to be manual. So maybe some coding standard stuff will have to be manual because it has too much to do with the problem that maybe we should possibly ever automate it to get inside new like that. So it still does mean it should be clear signal function. A lot of those code low level code stuff, you can get a lot of the basic ways uh, to test uh, uh, low level code and stuff like that. Uh, the harder things are things like that. Uh, uh, architectural things like scale, uh, history, and history of the business and that kind of stuff. But even though it's possible. Other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, good question. Uh, if you can't automate them, how do you make sure they get checked all the time? Deployment pipelines have manual stages. And you put that in a manual stage in your deployment pipeline and says this code is not ready to be deployed until this manual stage has been taken care of. And so that's exactly what you do. Uh, we build manual stages in deployment pipelines now for exploratory testing and that sort of stuff. You do the exact same thing for fitness functions. And there's actually a benefit to that because right now, let's say that you as a development team fight a good fight and you get your cycle time down to three weeks. But your security guys only look at your code every two months, and that's required before it can go live. And so now you can't release anything more than two months. But now you can go to the powers that be and say, look, all our other engineering stuff takes place in three weeks. If we can only get this other fitness function running in three weeks, then we could go live every three weeks. Well, that's pressure on the security. Then we'll start doing this manually every three weeks, and that allows us to get this live. By starting to treat those things as apples to apples, you can start saying, well, the problem with us going live every three weeks is one of our fitness functions takes two months. Well, what if we could get that down to three weeks? And so that's the manual fitness function. It's still part of that, the you know, pipeline. Uh, and so it's still required before we can move on to the next stage. But that helps put some pressure on them to actually uh, up their game. Yeah.
Hmm? Uh, arc unit is one of them. Code assert is one. Uh, let's see, structural 101, independent. Uh, there's a, a tool that says uh, accessibility called PALI, P A L L Y. Let's see, what else did I mention? Psychometric complexity, there are a handful of different tools that do that. I mentioned sonar cubes, that's a bunch of different functions. So, uh, there are a lot of tools out in the world that help you do this stuff. Um, some of them are just things you don't know that exist yet. Like Pally is one that I discovered recently uh, that checks accessibility, it makes sure that every single thing on the web page has accessibility links on it. That might be a fitness function. If one of your things is make sure that everything is accessible, you use Pally to make sure that those are all things, and that's just a tool that manages that. So some of this is just discovering tools that do this stuff for you uh, that aren't made out of the world. <coughs> when we wrote the book, we didn't know about arc unit. We only discovered that arc unit after the book was out. So that's another tool that we've only recently discovered that allows you to do a bunch of uh, interesting stuff like this. Any questions? So what do you mean by resilience? So, Well, but you can, Chaos Monkey does this for you. So you can actually download Chaos Monkey and adapt it to do exactly what you're talking about and set thresholds on it to say if it's below a certain value, then you start yelling after that. It. So, you know, Chaos Monkey, the whole thing in the army is downloadable. So you can actually download those things and start modifying them. And like I said, there's an entire book on Chaos Engineering that just came out. That's in the realm of Chaos Engineering. Uh, there's a whole book about that that just came out for Netflix engineers that actually talk about, you know, exactly how to implement these things and some of the philosophies behind them. So I mean, resiliency is really just a question of, so I want to test resiliency. Uh, so if you're, let's, like, let's make an assumption, because we have to, you know, uh, uh, let's say you're in a microservices architecture and testing resiliency of services. Almost all that resiliency is going to be managed by the service template the microservices architecture, right? And so and this is another one of those examples where I don't have to build the entire deployable system to test resiliency. What I need to do is create a service template, put a hello world service in it, I put a bunch of them out there and then start sending requests to them and see which of them fall over. That's resiliency. Instead of my threshold, I don't care about the domain behavior about it. I'm just testing the resiliency of the service template level. That's a much simpler test than trying to test the resiliency of the actual services and the domain and the transactions and all that stuff. We're trying to get out a single thing that we can test by resiliency and maybe test those other things later. But a lot of sense of resiliency are actually things that are easy to test just at the service template level just by creating a, a fake service and then doing whatever you want to it to make it start exhibiting behavior. So you can even do that for the ability to relax this kind of stuff. The harder part would be the implementation of the test would be the that's exactly what Casper really does. That's all it does. But to the, to the point, even if Chaos Monkey doesn't do this, the realm of engineering that covers that is Chaos Engineering. There's a book that just came out about Chaos Engineering that explains how to do this. And they make a really good point in the Chaos Engineering book. It's not a question of if your system is going to break. It's a question of when. So if you know that it's inevitable, why not start testing it before it breaks to see if you can figure out how it's going to break. That's the whole philosophy about test and test. So that's, that's the only, and they, the entire thing, I mean, all test must run on AWS, so you probably would have to modify that much to get it to do the stuff you want to do, because and most of the building blocks are already there, so that would actually be a fairly easy one to modify that.
more of the cloud provider like maybe Amazon or Google or even if you have to think about Well, so Netflix certainly cared about that, uh, and Bill Cass for that reason, because they couldn't rely on AWS managing all that stuff. Are you willing to bet your life on AWS and its resiliency and their engineers? My not. I'd rather test it and make sure that it actually works. So I don't think we can just offload all this on cloud providers. Well, first of all, not all applications run on the cloud. It's only a small percentage of applications run on cloud providers. There's still massive monolithic applications, other flavors of applications that have nothing to do with cloud cloud. But I don't think we're ever going to rely on them. And even if we do, they're only going to worry about the things that they care most about, not the things we care most about. What Netflix did was say, Look, AWS has all these mechanisms to keep themselves up, but it's a whole bunch of stuff we don't care much about. We care about, so their big metric is a, a stream starts per second. That's their key metric that they look at for, for being able to for resilience and a bunch of other stuff. And so and AWS doesn't care anything about stream starts per second, but Netflix does. So that's what they built their tools around. So I don't think we're ever going to be able to offload to the cloud products because they're going to care about very generic stuff. We're going to care about very specific specific stuff that we want to watch for, and so I think we're always going to be building some level of uh, support like this. I don't think we're ever going to be able to rely on the whole of these things. It'd be shocking if we did. One of our themes, our upcoming radar attack, which is coming out in about a month, uh, is a creeping cloud complexity. So it turns out that, and we've seen this pattern play out over and over again, you start with some simple, beautiful, elegant abstraction and then you start having to implement real solutions on top of it. And it starts getting messy and messy and it grows more and a bunch of other awful, nasty stuff. And we're seeing exactly that with cloud providers now, is people are having to start building real solutions on top of them. They're starting to build more and more complexity and break them into ways. I think we're going to see a trend in the last little while. Another question? Yeah, that's about it. Uh, this is uh, about the practical aspect of this companies. So, uh, on a typical agile development project, um, uh, at what point do you decide that uh, these fitness functions are necessary and uh, when do you decide to implement them? So, it's exactly the point where you decide you need to evolve your architecture. Uh, when, it, uh, <laughs> when you take up a new project and uh, you are doing test driven development, so every single project that I've worked on at Saltwater has had at least some metrics wired into continuous integration because I care about code quality when I'm an architect. Those would have been called fitness functions if we had invented this terminology 15 years ago. So every single project I've been on has had some aspect of this in it. Now the question becomes, how much effort do you want to put into making this project evolvable? So if I'm building a sacrificial architecture, I'm going to put 0% effort into making this evolvable. If I'm building a system that I expect to live for 10 years, I'm going to put a lot of effort into making this thing evolvable. Because if you don't, you're going to get three years into it and then realize that a whole bunch of things are starting to break and degrade, and now you can't fix those things because it's too late. If you really want to make long lived systems, I think you build a lot of the stuff in. From the, from the outset, because this is never going to make a software system last forever. We're just trying to get a fighting chance to make it last longer before you have to bite the bullet and rewrite it and restructure it or something like that. Um, one more question. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you, you talked about uh, having a deployment pipeline. So, there are projects uh, which, which, have, which don't have an automatic uh, pipeline to deploy. Okay. And they're typically released uh, once in a few months or maybe once a year. And they're typically manually released. So uh, a lot of these steps might be uh, very hard to implement. Yeah, I agree. 
But we very much build on the engineering practices from the past. So if you build a system with an abacus, we're not going to help you with a relational database. I can't, there's nothing I can do to fix broken things. So if you have terrible engineering practices, you should not do this. First thing you should do is make your engineering practices better, and then start doing that. So one of the first necessary things to make this work is continuous integration. And this actually goes back to the Lean Enterprise book that Jalen talks about. If you have no engineering practices, step one, continuous integration, because it gives you a platform to do other stuff, including running things like fitness functions. Step two, trunk-based development versus feature-based. I think it's step three was automated machine provision. So there are steps to upgrade your engineering practice. If you're deploying once a year, evolutionary architecture is not your problem. Getting your engineering practice up to the 21st century is your first problem. And then thinking about making it evolve away is your secondary problem. You can't leap directly from a big ball of mud into the most advanced kind of architecture you have without doing some engineering stuff. So it is not applicable for every project. And the more mature you are, we very much rely on all these engineering practices that came before us to make this stuff work. So we can't just start with nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you a, a, an ultimate question. You've worked on a lot of business systems, right? Are there unit tests, integration tests change? Have you seen any patterns in the way those change in your banking applications? They're all so specific to projects that there's no way we're going to harvest patterns. So one of the questions I often get is, can I download a framework for a bunch of fitness functions for my project? And the way I answer that question is, the last banking application you are on, can you take the unit, functional, and integration tests from that one and just drop it in the next banking application you're in? No, because it's so specific to that application. Fitness function is going to be the same way. It's going to be so hyper-specific to this application. But we want them to be hyper-specific to this application because we're testing the things that are really, really important to this application. So I think they're always going to be very, very specific and very, very localized. The other important thing to realize here is the distinction between things like unit test versus fitness function. So if it has anything to do with the domain, it's a unit test. So I'm checking about change of address, that's a unit test. If I'm checking about number of users, or elasticity of users, it doesn't matter if it's catalog users or insurance users or what kind of users, that's an architectural thing, and that's driven by fitness functions. So there is a little bit of a decision here about is this part of traditional agile testing or is this a fitness function? And the answer is, is it really purely about architecture or is there some domain aspect which you get a little bit of testing? All right, we've got time for probably one more question. So who's got the last question? That'll be worth something else. The last question. <laughs> no last question? One last question? There we go. There's one last question. <laughs> Hello. Thanks for this. Sure. So we, we actually go through quite a lengthy analysis in our book of a whole bunch of different architectural patterns, monolithic ones, microkernels, hyperstream, microservices, SOA, and talk about how evolutionary each one of those are, and define some more technical terms around the portable units and, and architectural quantum and that kind of stuff. So we, we actually address most of the major architectural patterns and, and talk about how those are evolving and will not be on that. Yeah, uh, like Yeah. 
So, uh, I think I have to get your question now. So, what's going to take more time? Building a system now that doesn't perform and trying to retrofit to make it perform in three years versus building a fitness function at the outset that governs performance and allows it to gradually grow and perform over time. I think that the one that has fitness functions is going to be way better to stay over time without having to go back and fix it. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, again, like, uh, when this comes come to the like all the scenarios, we need to cover in the fitness function. So like uh, this kind of uh, like what are the best tactics to uh, get those kind of requirements in the and get your thoughts on it? I mean, this is really just architecture. This is identifying the important architectural characteristics and thinking about what things we're going to need to support. Taking your knowledge of your problem domain and the, the ecosystem you're living in. I mean, there are no best practices because it's so individual to every project, all the things you have to take into account. I mean, it's really just it's the analysis of architecture. That's really what you're doing. You're just formalizing that and trying to codify it in tests rather than in a spreadsheet or something like that. So, I mean, there's no magic silver bullet best practice that says, you know, roll the dice, and this says, we this, we this, this, this. It's really just awareness of the system, where it's going to go, what our, of what our a strategic goal on from a business standpoint, how long is this system going to live, how many users we expect to have, what is the response time to you, I mean, all these things have to go into this decision criteria, but it's going to be very, very unique in every project, because every project has a unique combination of all those things that you support. So it's hard to give universal advice about that, because it's really going to be a case by case basis. Just like I said, most fitness functions are going to be very, very individual to a project. The same is true for these kind of characteristics, they're going to be very, very individual to Thank you. Uh, thanks, Steve, for the great insight to talk on your Thanks for having me. Thank you. And, um, how uh, fitness functions act as a regression to the architectural level. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, actually, uh, we usually have a one hour session in the first half and a break. Uh, we had a hard, hard stop because we had uh, to play back to eight. This is good therefore. Um, so please do fill in the feedback forms, please give your email addresses. Uh, we have, as Bill was mentioning, we have the next issue of the radar coming, we can keep you posted in the, uh, about our other upcoming sessions. Uh, before you leave, uh, we, we do have snacks. Uh, we couldn't have the break today. Uh, thank you all. One more quick answer. Uh, so this is a special edition of Geek Night with today, where Bill was here. Uh, this happens every first Wednesday of the month. And uh, this happens. The regular one happens to be the next week, Wednesday. And uh, one of our tech principals, uh, Shida Joshi, he is going to talk about uh, blockchain beyond Bitcoin. I think that's right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, make sure, like, know you are here uh, next Wednesday too. Okay. So we have some really good uh, ones. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks.